In today's broadcast, I want to begin our studies in 2 Corinthians. We have completed our studies in the first epistle, and now we begin the new study in 2 Corinthians. First and 2 Corinthians, of course, are letters which were written the same year and need to be taken together in study, because in this epistle, the Apostle Paul deals with some matters resulting from his first letter to the Corinthians. Some of the matters that he takes up in this second epistle are the restoration of the disciplined member who had been excommunicated, according to 1 Corinthians 5, for fornication. He's repented, and now he's to be taken back into fellowship. And then the matter of collection for the poor saints in Judea that he dealt with in 1 Corinthians 16. He deals here in chapters 8 and 9 in 2 Corinthians. He also addresses himself to the reason he's not yet come to Corinth, although he promised in 1 Corinthians 16 that he would be there. But his basic purpose in writing the second letter is to encourage the Corinthians to live and endure in faith through all of their trials, sufferings, and persecution, himself being an example of faith and endurance through much suffering and trial. Now, he suffered more than any of the apostles and far more than any of us, And if he could endure in faith through all that he went through, then we should be encouraged to do likewise. He speaks of this in verses 8 and 9, how that he despaired even of life and had the sentence of death in himself, but he trusted in God, had faith in God for deliverance, and God delivered him. And then again, over in chapter 4, in verses 8 to 12, he speaks of his trials and how we should be encouraged not to give up, He said, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. And so death worketh in us, but life in you, and so on. And then over in chapter 11, verses 21 to 28, a rather long statement of the many sufferings that he went through to encourage us to endure also. Of the critics of his apostolic ministry, he says, Are they ministers of Christ? He said, I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. He said, Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep, that is, in the ocean. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, and besides those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Now, he suffered more than any of the apostles, and as I said, far more than any of us. And if he could endure through things like that that we've read in these three passages, we certainly should not complain and murmur, and we should be encouraged to endure in faith also. And now let's come to a study of the epistle itself, 2 Corinthians. In verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1, Paul gives his customary greeting. Since we've already covered all of this in 1 Corinthians on verses 1 and 2, I would encourage you to send for the book and tape list and get the studies in 1 Corinthians because there's much interesting and, I believe, significant material which I gave on just verses 1 and 2. But we won't take the time to repeat it in 2 Corinthians since it's identical. Now, the main theme of the entire epistle is a defense of the apostolic ministry of Paul by Paul himself. And in the defense of his apostolic ministry, the apostle gives many admonitions and teachings beneficial for us as Christians living and enduring by faith. Now, the epistle, 2 Corinthians, 
actually divides itself conveniently into three main sections, which can aid our study if you want to write them down. First of all, it is living by faith, chapters 1 to 7, giving by grace, chapters 8 and 9, enduring by grace through faith, 10 to 13. Now that's living by faith, chapters 1 to 7, giving by grace, chapters 8 and 9, enduring by grace through faith, chapters 10 to 13. Now we begin with the first section, living by faith. That's chapter 1, verse 3, through chapter 7, verse 16. 1, 3, through 7, 16. And I want to deal in this broadcast with the benefits of suffering for our faith. Are you aware there are certain benefits, great benefits, in fact, in suffering for our Christian faith? That's chapter 1, verse 3 through verse 10, 3 to 10. First of all, what is the first benefit? Well, we can receive in our suffering divine comfort. It's because we can receive divine comfort that it's a blessing to suffer for Christ, for the Christian faith, verses 3 to 7. Now, while true Christian friends can be a real source of comfort when you're going through a trial or the death of a loved one and your family can sympathize with you and so forth, yet there are times, as much as they desire to help, they cannot really enter into your pain or your suffering. They cannot experience your anguish of heart. Let's say a loved one departs from the faith and goes into the world, or you have a husband or wife that's just spiritually lukewarm and it's a trial to live with them when they have no deep spiritual interest. And people, others, cannot enter into your responsibilities if you're a pastor, your responsibilities and concern with the flock and the problems that arise. But there is one who can know exactly what you're going through because he has experienced it all himself, and that is the Son of God. Now, if you have your Bibles, and I trust you do use your Bibles along with these studies in the Word of God. Turn with me to Hebrews chapters 2 and 4, and you'll see why that Jesus is qualified to comfort us. It's because he's been through these experiences himself. He's made like we are, and he's experienced the things that we do. Hebrews 2, verses 14 to 18, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, Jesus also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on himself the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things, now look at this, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he's able to comfort them that are tempted, to succor them or to comfort them who are tempted. Then over in chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, our weaknesses, but he was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. And so let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, do you do that when you have a need? And do you go to Jesus with the knowledge that he does really understand what you're going through because he has experienced the same trials and temptations? So there is one that knows exactly what you're going through right now, my friend. It may be a physical trial, a mental trial, a spiritual trial, financial trial, whatever kind of trial or temptation, while Christian friends Real friends try to sympathize with you in comfort, and your family, if they're sympathetic, are sometimes encouraging, but they can't really enter in many times into what you're going through, but there's one who can. And because of this, he's called here in verse 3 of chapter 1, the God of comfort, chapter 1 of Second Corinthians. And more than that, in verse 4, 
He's called the God of all comfort. And more than that, he comforts us in all our affliction. The God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction, our tribulation in the Greek. You may say to a friend or to a family member who's trying to comfort you in time of trial, but you don't know what I'm going through. Not really. Or you don't have any idea what it's like to suffer such pain. Or to have your best friends forsake you in time of need. Or to be reviled by those you're trying to help. No, perhaps they do not know that, but there is one who does know all this because he suffered worse pain than you, the agonizing pain of the crucifixion. And his best friends forsook him when he was arrested and crucified. And certainly he has experienced reviling and persecution. He was reviled by those he came to help, the Israelites, the Jews. And so this is why he is called the God of all comfort and can comfort us in all of our tribulation. When you need comfort, go to the source of comfort, Jesus Christ. Now, true Christians don't have to run to the doctor to have him prescribe tranquilizers, as many do after a funeral or during a funeral. They don't have to resort to feelings of self-pity if the family or their friends don't exhibit enough concern and sympathy in time of a real trial. And, of course, the reason is they go to the source to be comforted. Christians who've gone deeper than John 3.16 know all they need in time of any trial, test, or affliction is the God of all comfort, Jesus Christ. And my friend, if you've not learned this already and you're a Christian, I feel sorry for you because this means in time of real trial and need, many times you're going to be disappointed and let down, frustrated, and miserable when you find that your best friends are your family are disappointingly indifferent, are unconcerned about your need or problem when the doctors can't help you out of that situation. So you'd better learn now where the real source of all comfort is because at times it's going to be your only source of comfort. I remember one time, right after my mother died, I was getting ready to go to the funeral. I was about ready to leave when I got a call for ministry from a person. It wasn't anything serious, but they wanted to come over to the house and have prayer. And that person had many opportunities to do that when I'm at church, but never once asked, wanted special ministry all of a sudden. And I said, well, there are two other associate pastors and other ministers in the body. Go see them. My mother's just died. I'm on the way to the funeral. Well, I was backing out of the driveway when this person came anyway and insisted that I pray and no one else. Well, with the knowledge that others do not really understand your situation, not even when there's a death in the family, I went on and prayed for him and rejoiced in his deliverance. What I'm saying is I've learned long ago as a Christian, especially as a Christian minister, that many times others do not really enter into the trials and problems that you're going through. And so I've found it works just like we're told here, that I can go to the God of all comfort and there's no one else I really need.